Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. You're listening to a reading group episode of the show, which means that in this episode, I discuss political philosophy with two non-philosopher friends, Adam and Giffen, because philosophy shouldn't just be for philosophers. So with that introduction, please enjoy our discussion of political philosophy. Just a quick note before uh, we get to the episode. Uh, this was one of those recordings that was done many years ago. And in fact, if you're watching on YouTube, it's so long ago, you'll see that I had a full head of hair. Uh, so that will give you an idea just of how long ago this was. Um, this was back before Plato's Cave really kind of got started. Uh, so with that introduction um, and additional information, please enjoy this episode. So Giffen, you have uh, you've prepared uh, a comparison between the Declaration of the Rights of Man and uh, the Declaration of Independence, um, and also the Bill of Rights. So we're going to be and also the Constitution. Yes, yeah, and also the Constitution. Right. So we're going to be talking about those uh, four documents and the philosophy behind them and their authors uh, and uh, basically everything in that realm. So, um, okay, so what were your thoughts on like how we would go about actually doing the comparison? Yeah, so I guess we could just discuss um, the authors would be the primary thing we would want to lay down first. Um, I can just do that now. Um, so the uh, Declaration of Independence was largely crafted by Thomas Jefferson, as I'm sure you guys know. And uh, what you may not know, and the audience may not know, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, which is a French document, um, it was drafted um, prim primarily by um, a Frenchman by the name of Abbe Saez, um, and I butchered that pronunciation, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm not French, um, and the Marquis de Lafayette, which you, you shall remember uh, from American history. Um, <laughs> You, you shall remember it. You Just shall listeners. remember remember it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I should say for our for our international listeners, don't turn off the episode because I think like while this is kind of in an American context, I think the philosophies behind both documents are very generalizable. Um, yeah. But so, yeah, sorry. Continue, Giffen. Yeah, but um, so what's interesting though is that the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, which is, again, a kind of a foundational uh, document of the French Revolution and uh, had influences throughout Europe, really. Um, this was drafted uh, in consultation with Thomas Jefferson, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. Of course, uh, you'll, I mentioned, you'll from, remember from American history. Um, so I actually had contact with Jefferson while this was being drafted. So the fact that Thomas Jefferson kind of played a role in foundational documents in American history and European history is kind of my inspiration for the comparison. Yeah, actually, do you do you have the dates of like there being both documents being drafted, being published, just to kind of like contextualize all of this? Yeah, so um, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen, uh, what we're talking about here is 1789. And I'm, as far as I'm aware, it was drafted within... 1789 and also presented in that year but mm -hmm. you know there might have been a little bit before but it was definitely drafted within 1789 um, and this is a year that you should remember being the start of the french revolution and generally speaking okay interesting um so yeah uh how so how did you um want to go about like actually like do you want to systematically move through all of the 17 different rights or do you want to kind of hopscotch around like what's your what do you think what do you i definitely do? wanted to hopscotch around i don't want, i okay. want this to be a little bit more natural i'll i imagined i would bring up some like points get some discussion and then you know i'll bring up some you know comparisons you know mm -hmm. we can have a little bit of discussion on that not in a you know e point by point there's some definitely there are definitely some more minor uh um enumerated rights in the uh, declaration of the rights of man that we don't really need to discuss yeah so, so um, do you know, uh, this is kind of getting into like the minute history of it, I guess, but so was this document uh, published uh, like officially before the revolution? Was it kind of like during the stirrings of the French Revolution? <laughs> 
So that will depend entirely on when you actually define the French Revolution. But this is okay. a foundational document. So this is before the um the, the reign of terror, much before that was we're talking about like ninety two, ninety three for that. Um so this is some people would probably call this the beginning. Um I imagine the beginning of the French Revolution really being whenever um the estates generally needed to be called in the first place. Uh this is after the king was informed that France was out of money, basically, in no small part because of the tax scheme that has ruled France, you know, uh, mm -hmm. for centuries now. Um, and we can, I wanted to talk about that. I imagine that would be a good, interesting point of conversation. Um, but also, it was influenced by uh, the American Revolution. Uh, France financed and played a large role in the American Revolution, and for which... Um, uh, the crown paid mm -hmm. literally. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Cause I, I was just curious about that. Um, so what, so what were you saying about the, the tax system? Yeah. So, <clears throat> so basically the tax scheme, and this is something that you see throughout kind of feudal Europe. Um, it was one where the lower classes bared the brunt of the tax burden. Um, so in France, so we talk about progressive tax schemes, which is the standard scheme, um, of the modern world, right? Where the, the wealthier you are, the more you pay in taxes. Uh, in France, it was actually regressive in that the lower classes paid taxes and then the upper classes, the nobility specifically, um, had exemptions from taxes. <laughs> Seems familiar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, but that, that, yeah, that's kind of one of the motivating forces for a revolutionary change in a lot of Europe. Mm-hmm. There was a guy from our high school that argued for a regressive tax system senior year. <laughs> uh, to go back to the good old days. Good yeah. old days. The good old days of the feudal, yeah, feudal landlords. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah, we never even mentioned that. Like, we all went to high school together, the three of us. Um, yeah. A very and... diverse group we have here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're so, so much the same that we can't even represent different school districts. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Same elementary schools. So is it um, is it contentious to say that the I mean, maybe this depends on your current day of politics, but is it contentious to say that the regressive tax system was a direct cause uh, or at least one of the direct causes to the revolution? <laughs> I can't say it is the direct cause, but it is definitely a direct influence. Mm -hmm. it, like what well, I I was just asking because I could see. I don't know, like a like Ben Shapiro just you know chirping that like a regressive tax was actually helpful somehow because of trickle down economics or I, he would fabricate some sort of a response and I was just curious like how is there historical debate actually that that was like a leading cause to the the revolution or no? Quite frankly, I don't know of any such debate. I think it's pretty uh, sound reasoning that yeah. the tax structure um, played a role in the French Revolution. I don't think that would be... I, I'm sure you could find someone who's making the regressive tax scheme was like the... This was like the peak of human civilization, but mm -hmm. I, I've never heard such an argument. I, I, I can't the, uh, remember... Oh, go ahead, Adam. I was going to say the, uh, the third estate was the, the peasantry class, right? And, and the... Uh, and, like, <laughs> and, and, and... No. So, so I'll... Um, that's a good thing to bring up is because uh, one of the things that kind of started the French Revolution was the calling of the Estates General. I mentioned that earlier. And sure. there were three estates um, that embody basically the nation of France. It was the, the clergy, uh, the nobility, and then the third estate. Um, Which made up just everyone else. the third estate else. was everyone okay. else. It wasn't, okay. it wasn't right. just the peasantry. It was also, um, you know, business people. Uh, anyone involved in like commerce, merchants, lawyers, all of these people. So a, you know, well-off professionals are also in this group. And you'll see that that's a, a very driving motivational force. And they were still being taxed. So it was just, was it just the third estate that was being taxed? So it was not just the third estate being taxed, but there were, like I mentioned, certain... Uh, exemptions that the nobility specifically had. And I will not pretend to be a, an expert on the tax structure of pre-revolutionary France, but I can tell you that the third estate 
had tax burden that was you know higher. It was a regressive tax uh, scheme. What about the clergy? I frankly don't know much about the clergy, quite frankly. Okay. Yeah, I feel like it, they, it was important like, enough to be its own class. I feel like they could have weaseled themselves a few exemptions. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that's the way God wanted it. <laughs> yeah, the clergy plate. I wish I could say I knew more about the clergy's role, but in reality, the French Revolution became very secular in nature. Mm-hmm. It was only in conservative reactions where you saw the clergy trying to claw back some influence. Mm. So that I think that nicely sets up the context for um, this document. Uh, yeah. So uh, the question I have first is, um, so there's obviously like one through 17 of these, but were they, when they were published, were there actual like numerated one through 17 articles? Um, I believe, like, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. the, the document itself had like a, a preamble or like pretext. Mm-hmm. And then there were articles that were specifically enumerated. I I think it would probably use Roman numerals. It was like Article 1, and then, of course, it was French. but And then it laid out Article 1, and then it was Article 2 all the way down to 17. Okay. Because I, I was just – I didn't know if I was kind of imagining some sort of a ranking or importance or um, if it was purposefully laid out like that. Do you Do you know? Uh, the, the physical laying out of the document, I, I could not say. Um, okay. You'd have to you'd have to consult the Marquis de Lafayette. Okay, because I was just curious if, like, if if for some reason one was like the most important and seventeen was the least important. Uh, no, I imagine this probably came about through like discussion, you know, conversation, mm-hmm. debate. You know, the first thing you know the people decided, you know, over the drafters of the, um, you know, the Declaration said, yeah. you know, maybe if there was some like strong agreement about you know, that might've made its way first. And then later ones were added, you know, I, I really can't say, I'm not sure it's terrible. So probably, probably just, you know, there's a correlation in the sense that, you know, the more important ones will enter, you know, the, the conversation for maybe less important ones, but there's no guarantee that that's the case. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's exactly that, what my line of thinking was. And right, the interesting so. thing is that like, Included in the title, it's the, it's they're declaring the rights of the man and the citizen. So rights do kind of, just like by their nature, tend to kind of be on an even playing field. Like no right, it, it, rights do supersede other rights, but it does sort of have like an elevated... Uh, no, I think you're do, right. Do you know what I mean? So we're yeah. getting at natural rights here. So these are things that are, well... You know the so I guess I should mention some of the inspiration uh, for the document. It's it's really uh, an expression of Enlightenment thinking, and then the common uh, influence beyond just general Enlightenment thinking is going to be Rousseau, mm. um, and specifically his concept of the general will. And there's a little bit of debate as to how much Rousseau himself would have agreed with both his use, like the drafters of the Declaration's use of the word, like the phrase "general will." as it Mm -hmm. pertains to like the declaration itself and also some debate about like what his thoughts on the consequences it had for like the French revolution and the French governments. Mm -hmm. But those are the primary influences. And in, in that is the idea of the natural right. And you see this in, uh, American, you know, revolutionary documents as well. Yeah. Yeah. These are kind of supposed to live on a higher tier than like, <clears throat> right through like law yeah and i guess they almost seem to be on a higher tier but then equal within that tier um <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? theory maybe yeah I, I get what you're getting at like these are they can't be um <clears throat> ranked within this category of the rights now i'm sure yeah. that individual like uh drafters and the important players of the french revolution probably had some preferences um but <laughs> yeah from a moralistic standpoint they probably these are supposed to be rights that are enshrined mm-hmm. uh, but even that kind of depends from i mean when, when reading through it there are a lot of caveats involved in oh, many yeah. of the, in many yes. of the rights given so it's like yes they are rights and they are above the law yet a lot of these do take into account that laws can directly enter 
this sort of um uh framework of rights so you're which absolutely is weird, right, right? Because it, it, this is supposed to be framing the laws. I kind of took it to mean, right? <laughs> so this is where we get one of the major differences between like the American documents and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Um, there's some sim- a lot of similarities to be drawn. Like I said, Jefferson was involved in both personally. But you will notice as you, if you go through the list of the, art- uh, the articles in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, that there, a lot of them introduce... The caveat, like, you know, this right is enshrined for all people, you know, for all men and citizens, except in the case that law Mm -hmm. restricts it, unless in the case that it, um, you know, betrays the general will, things like that. Those caveats are huge because the Declaration, like the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence don't really introduce these clauses. Um, and that's one of the things I thought we could talk about a lot because, yeah, the way it has. Can we dive into four right now? Like Absolutely. Article 4. I, sure. I think that one best sort of exemplifies what we're talking about. It says, Article 4 says, Liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. Hence, the exercise of the natural rights of each man has no limits except those which assure to the other members of the society the enjoyments of the same rights. These limits can only be determined by law. So it's like, okay, yeah, you can you can pretty much do whatever you want as long as you're not harming anyone else. And what determines whether you're harming anyone else? Well, the law, right? <laughs> so you're it's, absolutely it's just, right. Yeah, it's, so it's so how are four and five different? Because five says law can only prohibit such actions as are hurtful to society. Nothing may be prevented which is not forbidden by law, and no one may be forced. I guess I guess it maybe so, just expands on it. I guess no I could forced. imagine a situation yeah. in which. Uh, a law could restrict an action that is helpful to society, um, which happens to injure someone else in some sort of strange way. Like Does that makes sense. Like so, maybe killing infants that have like a brain malady. I'm not willing to say. Uh, or just like as an but, example, like maybe something I mean, like that. Possibly. So liberty okay. consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. Um, so. It, it's it's difficult to say they're they're related there's probably some like theoretical overlap there um but again the the caveat of the law being instituted into this is incredibly interesting well what actually i think the difference i don't know the 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 fourth right seems to be almost more focused on like the practicality of things and then five seems to be more focused on harms or like like hurt hurts to, uh, you know, hurtfulness to people. Because like four, four kind of says like, well, you know, the, the exercise of each right has no limits except those which assure that other members have the same rights. So like, you know, you it, it almost kind of sets a ceiling to some rights in some categories. But the other one. The fifth article seems to be more concerned about preventative harms, like restri- like it's a positive versus a negative freedom, right? Like four is trying to maximize your positive freedoms that you have, and five is telling you which negative freedoms are restricted. Yeah, so four seems to describe liberty and its relation to the law, and then five describes um, the context of law, like the breadth of law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I... I, I that's okay. That actually answers my question because I wrote on my little page. I said, "How are these different?" Four and five. So, what is four? Do you guys take four to be talking about something like a victimless crime? Because, um, like, I wasn't sure where that fell in the bounds of this. Uh, these rights, but maybe specifically between four and five. Yeah, I I, th- I kind of read the same thing as you, um, that four does speak to a victimless crime. Like when I was reading it, I was like, okay, this would be very interesting in the in the context of drug laws, right? <laughs> I wrote Just, that on my paper, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. But then when I read five, it said law can only prohibit such actions as are harmful to society. I was like, well, there you go with some ambiguity again. It comes yeah, down to, like, you yeah, know, it yeah. although it doesn't directly injure someone else, this could be, you know. Uh, just 
deleterious for society in general. Therefore, it's worthy to, you know, outlaw it or criminalize it in some sort of way. So. And, it, and it seems like it's already it's already kind of you're seeing the tension of weighing rights, you like the right to alter your own consciousness versus the right to, um, I guess, like have a functioning society. Right? Yeah, not, not that's that, not something that taking, I wanted to discuss. Yeah, not, because... not that taking drugs just destroys society instantly. But, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I know what you mean. But this yeah. is something that's actually very interesting, the way of, that France and the United States well, really, it's the United States and other European countries have developed because you, you do see a lot of um, contradiction in uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, but also you see, like, exemptions that seem intuitive to me. So um, the, that might have implications in terms of the ability of, like, Congress to affect society positively. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you? What's an example of that? Yeah. So, so the Bill of Rights enshrines <laughs> the rights. First one. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, these they describe rights, but they don't introduce any caveats. So, uh, that introduces an interesting kind of paradigm, because the United you've seen this in the United States history a lot. Um, there's a huge anytime there's any idea of an infringement of right. <laughs> um, it is an enormous issue. Um, I mean, well, it was only like in this uh, century, really, like almost a decade ago, a little over a decade ago, where the um, right to uh, personally own firearms was affirmed in the Supreme Court. Um, but this was kind of. Do you see? Do you see what I'm getting at? Kind of, yeah. The the one actually, I I kind of wanted to wait to get to this, but it seems too relevant right now. Yeah. Um. The, I, I noticed, like, there were several themes I noticed between the two documents, but one of them was, um, like, highlighted and exemplified in the first, like, the comparison of the first uh, right, um, was the, the Declaration of Independence is, it ha the document has much more of a religious tone to it, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man has much more of a secular tone to it, Um so, like, e even even in the first, uh, you know, like in the Declaration of Independence, it says all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So they even reference, like, these rights are grounded in the fact that they came from a creator. So it seems to be an exceptionless sort of like a, a not necessarily supernatural, but sort of super secular uh way of looking at it and and in the Decla declaration of rights of man they say all men are born and remain free and equal in rights social distinctions may be founded upon only the general good so it, it there's just like a huge difference in tone that i sensed even from the first yeah. one on. yeah i think what you're sensing is the uh, american founders they had a propensity towards deism mm -hmm. which is reflected in the documents uh, whereas, again, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, the French Revolution took very secular, um, had very secular influences mm -hmm. um, almost throughout. And just sort of circling back around to what we were just talking about like a few seconds ago. But, um, I mean, as a result of that, of these two trends, you see that, you know, the Bill of Rights seems to lack a little nuance that the, you know, the Declaration of Rights of, you know, uh, man and citizens seems to have yet at the same time like when you read some of these articles you can see the danger in the nuance though you know mm -hmm. what i mean that you you i mean it's just it's very dangerous how these seemingly like you said giffen intuitive caveats can become very dangerous like um I, 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 I just want to repeat again you know law can only prohibit such actions as are hurtful to society what <laughs> I mean, I mean, who determines that? Who determines which well, actions and, are hurtful to society? Adam, you're getting I mean, at something and, very yeah. good. And also, and also, yeah. like, honestly, I don't want to sound like a Republican, but one of the things that make makes America great is the fact that there are some freedoms that we have that actually do harm society, but we still have those freedoms, right? Like, if we wanted to, um, you know, like you, you have, you, you really do have the right. Uh, to do a lot of things that are deleterious to society. Like, we could make the speed limit five miles an hour. 
and no one would ever die from a, you know, like a highway accident ever again. But, um, you know, we don't do that. So, but the, you know, if we were reading the Declaration of Rights of Man literally, it seems like, you know, that's well within the law's capacity to do. You're, you're absolutely right. So what I kind of imagine when reading these two and seeing the comparisons is you're right. The nuance does seem a little bit dangerous. And I, it does not go um, kind of beyond me that the United States has basically stayed relatively um, together since the Constitution, really. We had a civil war, of course, but <laughs> th- we're, b- there's an argument that we're on our first republic or, well, second if you count the Articles of Confederation. But the France is on, like, what, their fifth or sixth republic? Like, the, And I think that is because the uh, American documents, they do enshrine higher the liberties, often at the expense of societal progress. But the, the upside of that is the um, Declaration of the Rights of Man and then their caveats are dangerous because if you have an, an executive branch or a dictatorship in which they define harmful to society super broadly, well, you can kind of invoke the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in terrifying ways. So, so the argument is that that explains why we're still on the first iteration of our republic that's interesting i don't know that it explains it wholesale but i think it definitely is a moderating force or not necessarily even moderating but a a force that pulls you know away from you know radicalization well this is like that actually plays into something i wanted to ask uh like you guys about too because this is I think this kind of gets to the quintessence of the deep, I guess, like distinction and values that people have between um, who is responsible for societal upkeep. Is it is it like the culture itself or is it the government? Um, So like this is I I don't know why like Ben Shapiro is coming to mind again, but he (laughs) I've heard him say like he. um. I like I, just to just to put it out there as an argument like he he's said that the um you know like the reason why taxes should be low is because help should be kind of neighbor to neighbor and it should be voluntary and it should be based in a religious context that seems much more akin to the declaration of independence where you know someone who is more secular and progressive um i think david packman pushed back against this and said well, no, like that, that was fine in an, in a more antiquated time, but now we need a larger, more secular, more, uh, governmental institution to take care of its citizens. So I thought that like the fourth and the fifth, uh, uh, articles here, like really got to the core of that debate. Yeah. And just to, you know, kind of comment on that, at least for my view of American history, I, I see that you know, with societal progress, there has been a a wave of thought outside the purview of the government. But once that wave becomes big enough, then those sentiments are enshrined in the culture by the government, right? I mean, we see that with slavery. We see that with things like, you know, even things like prohibition. What about... Um, Wait, no. sorry. Do you, do you mean enshrined in the government by the culture, or enshrined in the culture by the government? So, well, I'm I'm saying that you know there is a big enough wave in the culture that to sort of impose these cultural values on everyone. Okay. The government then enshrines it in the culture. So it trickles up to the government, and the government then spreads it over the whole culture. Yeah. Sure. Adam. Okay. Yeah, I I that that's been my view of history. It's I, I think pretty much any cultural movement, I, I would I would argue maybe you could find an exception, but I would say that they've pretty much all followed that trend. It's not like the government from day one was like, OK, here are the values we're going to push upon everyone. <laughs> it was more like a majority of people came to these values, but there was still a minority of people that didn't share them. But then the government was like, OK, now we're all going to collectively share these values. That, that's how I've seen it. But, yeah. So I think what you're getting at is the. Um something that i didn't touch upon prior but that the constitution you know is amendable um and that is a way and again it that's a hefty requirement for the culture to get to that point right sure there's an argument that it is less responsive to the needs of the people 
But at the same time, once the force gets big enough, we have the capacity to amend it. I, I hesitate to say easily. We haven't done it in a while. <laughs> well, it's, well, but it's it's a little easier than you think, though, because we don't actually have to amend the Constitution directly. Because I mean, think about civil rights, right? All you have to do is reinterpret the Constitution in such a way that you could, <laughs> you know, you know, no. But I'm saying that no, it know, is a, that, that is a path that yeah. is enshrined in the United States government. So. Right. I mean, <laughs> no, how, about, it is. How, how about Brown v. Board of Education, 1950s? Was it 54? I mean, it was th that was just a reinterpretation of the of the Constitution. So, Adam, what I so the kind of perspective that I'm going to prod you with is that okay. <laughs> get so ready for I, your product. <laughs> is it possible that um, that these these kind of like um, governmental, like executive or legislative um, manifestations of these societal agreements is a betrayal of the constitution and th we should be going through the constitution to make these things you know acceptable but rather we have accepted as a society in a little bit of a betrayal of the constitution that these other avenues you know through the judicial um you know kind of interpretation and through legislative action can kind of get some of the responsiveness to the people that the constitution is just a little bit too rigid for well, I mean, I I don't want to, you know, prevaricate like a politician here, but I I will say that, you know, the many of the founding fathers were men of the Enlightenment. You know, they were men of the American Enlightenment, and I think that many of them, given how much culture has progressed, would find it acceptable to operate in a way to reinterpret the Constitution in such a way to allow for cultural progress. That would be my argument. So. <laughs> So I'm, I see, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here a bit. Sure. I mean, I'm kind of in a general agreement with the sentiment at least, but I, I think there's a good argument that like the flexibility that you're just talking about is rather through reinterpretation could be through amendment, like textual amendment. Yeah. Is, yeah. I, and the thing is textual amendments, um, I guess if I were to counter that, then I would be betraying the essence of the constitution because, but I, I will, I will make a maybe not so bold statement and say that it is too slow. It is too slow. We've discovered in 200 years of this country that it's just too slow. I mean, if we were going to solve everything by literally amending the constitution, we wouldn't have gotten civil rights. Adam, you're it exactly right. Happened. And that's what one Does of the that... things I wanted to bring up between yeah, the declaration yeah, yeah. of the rights of man like the constitution and the bill of rights and the declaration of independence enshrine ideas and are the foundation of government, but they are inherently more rigid than, you know, this other very important piece of like Western um, thought. Sure. And, 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 and the thing is, I'm, I'm not going to gripe about, about the fact that we have such a rigid constitution because there is a subset of the population, including me, that is happy to have a rigid constitution. And yet you know, uh, interpret it in a flexible way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, I, I will bathe in that hypocrisy. So does I mean, that, I almost wonder if that by not going through the avenues of it though, does it like, does it degrade its uh, power over time? Because like, I guess I don't understand like, I guess it is Giffen's question a bit, I'm almost entirely, but, like, I guess, like, can you explain to me again, like, why, if we kind of circumnavigate it, almost, like, we, we just, you know, we're looping around and around, and each time we, we, you know, we pass it again, we kind of reinterpret it a bit more. Um, does that, is it too, is it like, a, you know, like, what, what's the, the, the saying about a tree, if it bends, it won't break, but if it's too rigid, then it will? Is it that sort of a thing? Yeah, but keep in mind, though, that, you know, mm -hmm. even when reinterpreting the Constitution, the Constitution is still the basis for whatever changes in law or rights people will have, right? I mean, it's not like you can't say, you can't reinterpret the Constitution to mean exactly the opposite of what it's saying. Yes. You yes. know, or so can't... I, don't, I, <laughs> I, think... I don't think, I, I, what would be a good example of, the exact opposite so, or uh, or something maybe um outside the spirit of the constitution okay right? I, I so 
I'll recognize that there's probably a subset of like the population in America that think that 90% of government is outside the bounds of the constitution. Recognizing that though, I, that I am, that I don't think any of us are part of that group. Um, I will um, give you an example possible. Sure. So, Go for it. so it, do you all agree that equality is one of the kind of enshrined principles of the American documents? Yeah, for white the, males, yeah. Well, the Fourteenth Amendment, the Fourteenth Amendment. So yes, yes. yeah. yeah. So I, was, I, was just I kidding, will extend yes. this. I will extend this, you know, to include, you know, all of the amendments. But um, I think I would argue that, like, um, the fact. I mean, all men are created equal. You know, that wasn't the Fourteenth Amendment. So I, I would argue it was enshrined earlier. But I, you're correct. So we all agree. Well, I but. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, the 14th Amendment was just a little more explicit about it, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> just I think it was just, all yeah. men. It was basically <laughs> uh, stating yeah. for everyone that there was a huge, um, you know, kind of hypocrisy going on prior. You know, they sure. you can you can state the values and then, you know, go to your field, you know, field you hands. Find them later, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. sure. But sure. so so this is my argument, and this is a comparison that I kind of wanted to bring up. I wanted to see your thoughts on it. Um. Positive discrimination. So, um, you know, how this is something that you could argue pretty easily, actually. You mean affirmative action? Yeah, affirmative <laughs> action. So, yeah, yeah, thank you for reframing that. Yeah. But positive discrimination, affirmative action. There's very good arguments, and I'm sympathetic to them a little bit, in fact, um, that that's without, outside the bounds of the Constitution. And to make this a little bit more interesting and tie it to the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, Affirmative action and positive discrimination like that is not a thing in France. It is explicit because of the interpretation of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. It is con it con it is considered to betray the sense of equality that's enshrined. Do Do you know? I, I want to know specifically, like where um where is France pulling from to say that that is not allowed? Like which right specifically? Do you know? Um. It's a good question, actually. Um, Article one says men are born for, born and remain free and equal in rights. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's there's little you know drips and drops of that kind of sentiment throughout the uh, document. But I, I would want to know I which one specifically. Um, I I just uh, sorry that is a really hard thing to just look up yeah, on no, the spot. There's, there's but... 17 of these things and I don't have them memorized. But no, I know. I Article know. one is the one that <laughs> stands out to me. That's the one I do know. Because it's just like, I honestly, I don't know I if, if I mean, it could also just not be explicit. Like the government could have said, yeah, based on Article you know 10, whatever it is, uh, that like this is why we're not going to allow it. Or they could have just no. referenced the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in general. I do think Article 1 is probably what they would point to. Men okay. are born and remain free and equal in rights. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, you know, a pretty pretty broad statement and i find it interesting that we have been kind of assuming to this point that the constitution and the american documents are you know almost at a higher tier you know broader in scope in their rights well, they seem to the be more time, rigid yeah say it again well, they seem to be more rigid i don't know about broader well they don't have exceptions in the yeah, same they're uncompromising they're... but but i don't know yeah. if that's broader per se Okay, I mean, this is just semantics, but okay, I think no, we agree I, no, on the, I know, the sentiment. Yeah. Yes, yes. Sorry. Oh, I just wanted to make I, sure we did. I just found it interesting that we kind of, in general, assume the American documents are less compromising, and yet at the same time allows, we have, as a society, kind of allowed affirmative action to have but, a place, you know, in that. But society. do you think that goes, like you were saying, outside the Constitution? He is I saying there's that. a strong argument for yeah. it, yeah. Because yeah, so, it, it is... It, it is a system in which um, you have a group of people by birth have a, an inherent advantage. Yeah. I would have to read the Supreme Court decision on affirmative action to comment. However, I can't think of a good reason why it would be constitutional as the layman that I am. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, right? I mean, right. This is an incredibly I mean, nuanced I, discussion, and it's really responding to societal um, uh, difficulties Wimps. that yeah. France didn't see, you know, in the same way. There's a lot of different forces, and uh, this I can almost bring up here another point that I kind of planned on mentioning is that there's there's a good argument for a sense of American exceptionalism 
Um, I, so what are your thoughts on American exceptionalism? But define that for the audience. I, I mean, different people are going to define it differently, but generally, it's sure. the sense U.S. That, number one. Yeah, <laughs> so for some people, it's that the United States can and never will and never has done any wrong. But for That's other ridiculous. people, it's just that the United States is very unique in the world. Sure. Um, and that we shouldn't, there's no reason necessarily to model our system of, of, of life or government after any other society because we are just unique. unique. And yes. There is, is something inherently good, good about our society. Well, that's ridiculous. There, no, there is. <laughs> that has been brought up many times whenever ideas are brought up, especially pulled from other nations, even like Western nations, that it can't work because the United States is too unique. Um, and I would make a good argument that um, especially. How do I phrase this? There is a good argument for American exceptionalism, but it doesn't like um, come down to some dogmatic, you know, religious in, uh, you know, approval of the United States, but it does come down to the circumstances under which the nation was founded. Um, because what we have in the United States and what we have in France to com make the direct comparison are completely different. There is the model for giving rights to people and the model of government for the United States was we, there was no like peasantry class in the United States at its founding. There was no rural, like there was no poor like, in the same way that we saw it in like France at the same time. Right. Um, oh, I'm saying right, but, um, but yeah. well, I, I, it, it depends what you mean by poor. Right. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't say there was any poor class, you know, but I would say that there was already, you know, great income inequality between those who were crafting the Constitution and just and the slaves. average, well, and, and the average person who resided in, you know, the average constituent oh. in these states. So, yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say poor, though. I mean, you yeah, there is... No, so there, the founding of the country is, is heavily rooted in, uh, you know, merchants. You know, you have like a merchant class and a surrounding lawyer class. And that is a huge, like, this is a huge body compared to the France, where you have, like, just enormous millions of people that are just urban poor, you know, and before industrialization, they're just, you know, poor, they, they eat bread, and if they can't get bread, they die. They're sure, right, yeah. Not, and not there's a nobility extent. that, while you could argue that some, um, you know, some places in, like, the South, especially, um, like, Virginia, the FFBs. kind of have, yeah, exactly, the yeah. first families of Virginia, you can argue sure. that they kind of have an aura of the nobility but at the same time it's not quite to as extreme as it was in france where they had specific no noble rights and tax exemptions and there were people who were like the the land workers for the nobles who were like one of the one of the rules that was you know a thing at this point one of the feudal dues was at least like you know a certain number of days of free labor was owed to the nobles a year so this is a system that was not in place in the United States. Um, of course, you, there's a, the slavery, um, but it's it's new. It's very different. Well, I'm not right. I'm not talking about slavery necessarily. I'm talking about there were already well established families in the United States that intended to construct a government that would serve their interests and, to be fair, serve the interests in, you know of the constituents in their individual states. Right. Absolutely. So. But but I want you to make your point though. This was this was the yeah. What's premise. there yeah. for? Yeah. Yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying like there, there's something unique about the our founding. Oh um, yeah. So yeah. what I was getting at was, it is something too important. The American exceptionalism. There's a good argument here, specifically as it relates to how the United States can or cannot serve as a model for other nations, to and other peoples to gain rights. So in, in Europe, you know, you have basically anywhere in Central or um, Eastern Europe, you have people that, you know, were, were behind even like England and France at the time. And it is difficult for me to imagine that these people would be able to look towards um, the founding of the United States as a, you know, a way as a um, as a model for themselves, you know, either for like the, the people, like the poor, like the, um, you know, the the. the relative third estate like the businessmen um because i don't think it just the united states didn't serve as a good model and it, i don't think it really served as a good model for anywhere not even um other nations in the west in the new world do you yeah. 
Well, I, hence, come... oh, no, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. Well, I, I just wanted to ask, like, it, so does that difference? Is it hinged on something in like the like the uh, the zeitgeist, or was it more? Is it something physical? Like, is it actually like the physical form that our are you know like the people of the American Revolution had, or like is it the like the geographical? Like, what is that difference that you're saying? So, so to get it, I can't say I know for sure. You know, mm -hmm. the, the absolute essence. What's your suggestion? <laughs> yeah. But so what I would suggest. What was the question? To, just once again. I, I was asking Giffen like so. Giffen said that he he didn't think that the American Revolution could serve as a good model or a good example to have other countries, specifically maybe Central or Eastern Europeans, acquire rights. So I asked him, is that The Constitution different... or the American Revolution? Well, Giffen, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kind of, I think, I think there's a, a difference there, right? Kind of both. Okay. So what I'm going to invoke here um, is, a, well, a couple things. So to, to kind of get at the core of this, you, you can kind of say, Jordan, you mentioned geography, and it is true that there were a lot of geography problems that Europe would have because it was settled for so long. Well, settled for so long that you, the United States didn't really have mm -hmm. uh, in a large part because a lot of the natives had already passed by the time Europeans arrived. And also in large part because of, you know, um, conflicts between the two that were won by Europeans. And at the time but, being landlocked was hugely different than being an ocean away. That, from, from what? Like from away from, the oh, from the you're gaining independence from. Yeah, that is the, the yes, that is the yeah. next point, too. And this is something that there's a great comparison to the uh, South American revolutions, because um, in the United States, we were blessed with something called salutary neglect. Um, you guys familiar with the term? Yes. Basically, I've two centuries of yeah. England not caring how the colonies run as long as they benefit in some way, <laughs> uh, you know, commercially. And they won't even they wouldn't even enforce really. Some of the laws that they did have that were governing the colonies, you know, in respect to commerce. I mean, I think you guys have heard, uh, you've probably heard the idea that a lot of the early Americans were smugglers, basically. Like, they were expert yep. smugglers. And mm -hmm. that's kind of as a result of the salutary neglect. And that's something that not even other American, um, and I say American in a, in a pan-American sense, not other American nations had. Because, so, of course, the other great power in the New World was Spain. Um, and the Spanish instituted a very rigid system of viceroyalties in the New World. And so there was an enshrined... Um... What are you laughing at? I'm here? sorry, it's such a... Giffen is talking about like the philosophy of the basis of social revolution, and Adam just takes a hit from a bit. <laughs> sorry, the, the 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 distinction there just got to me. I couldn't stop laughing. Uh, or maybe, or, or maybe, I, but I don't think it was anything. There was something distinct about it. I think that they were harmonious, actually. <laughs> I think I think one fit the other perfectly. I, I, I think I heard somewhere that uh, George Washington vaped. I'm not entirely sure I, about that. I think check. I think the wine fits more with the theme than the vape. <laughs> well, I'm trying to quit. I know this is the quickest. Well, here's the thing. Quit. I mean, if wait, we, wait, we, wait, wine or quit vaping? <laughs> quit vaping. Okay, but here we can cut this section out because it's not entirely interesting. Sure. But so I was hitting that jewel pod, right? Okay. Or yeah. or the or I was hitting the jewel. I mean to say. Okay. And I was smoking like a pod and a half a day, which is equivalent Holy to like a pack shit, and a hack, a pack no, and a half like of cigarettes. Twenty packs. No, it's not. It's a pack oh, and a half of it? cigarettes a day. Okay. All right. That's anyway, insane. but it's still insane. Holy so many cigarettes, Jordan. You might be thinking. Oh yes, that's right, Giffen. Twenty packs. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. Whole <laughs> twenty packs a day. <laughs> sorry, sorry. No. Giffen was right. Okay, but so this is like. It's gotten me down to it's just like a friend's. I've been borrowing it just at night, but it's I've been smoking the equivalent mm. of like I don't know a cigarette or two a night for the last week now. So I haven't bought any more jewel pods. So I'm trying to like wean myself off. I'm happy for you, Adam. That's good. That's good. Good luck. <laughs> too too bad that there's so much smoke involved here. It's I mean it's not very uh, inconspicuous, but I think uh, it adds to the texture of the conversation. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Giffen. I just, I, I couldn't keep that in. <laughs> I get it, I get it. I, I really, I, I'm sorry if I derailed you. Humor is one of the rights, I think. 
<laughs> Adam's Adam's Republic, the right to vape. <laughs> okay, okay, uh, okay. If I can remember my point, we can ah, get back shit, to I'm it. Sorry, no, it's okay. So I was talking about um one of the differences to kind of get at what you know what fundamentally was different about the United States. A good source of comparison is the other um, nations in the New World, because you're right. One of the one of the enormous uh, factors is that England, which is the oppressive body in this case for the American Revolution, was an ocean away. There, like there was no physical location here. But France didn't have that. You know, the people of France, the Third Estate, did not have that luxury of having a a king. You know, an ocean away doesn't really care. They didn't have salutary neglect for two centuries. Um, they they had a king who lived a life of luxury, towering above them, and that is one interesting difference. But the New World, if you look at other um, countries, especially uh, those which were Spanish territories, Spain had instituted a uh, system of vice royalties, which were basically um, relatively rigid government structures. Largely, the power here was enshrined not by those people who were lived and were born in the New World, but rather the people who were from Spain, peninsulares, um, from the Iberian Peninsula. And that basically... The way the Spanish set up their colonies almost in sh- almost took away from the benefit the United States had of having an oppressive body an ocean away. Mm. So that's, I think, a good place to kind of imagine where American exceptionalism is valid. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in its founding. I, I don't fully buy the how the, how the founding necessarily makes the United States that exceptional in its in its unique government now. I mean, well, so there there were a few sort of oxymoronic statements in there actually. <laughs> but but what I what I mean to say is that although its government structure may be just unique from other governments, I don't see why we necessarily can't um I, I don't know, try to you know, uh I can't even think of the word right now because I drank too much wine. But regardless, <laughs> I, I why we can't just adopt, you know, other very good aspects of other governments. So, Adam, can I give make a point here? Sure, go for it. So the reason that I think that so you're arguing that at its founding, yes, there were some exception, but really it's been it's wa- it's waned since then, right? That's kind of your well, general argument. Yes, just due to the fact that I think there is a distinction between how the United States was how the, how our government was founded. And how it's operated over the last 200 years. So I okay. think what ties I, I think there's a these ideas. There. Yeah. So I think what ties the idea is the Constitution, which has, I think, the United States was really kind of privileged almost in that it didn't really need to take. Um, so the ideas that were enshrined here are, yeah, at the time were a, a little radical, right? Sure. But in a, in a, invoking the sense of radicalism is uh, for the United States is a little bit different than it is in France. We had kind of like um, a a the salutary neglect left us with out having to push radicalism too far, and because of that, I think that is what influenced the founding and probably had a large influence, you know, on the Constitution and like the rights enshrined as compared to France, at which we you know let's draw the comparison. Um, <clears throat> But that has stayed with us. And so in a sense, whereas at the beginning it was a great benefit, I think there's an argument that the American exceptionalism of today is more of like an anchor. So I, I guess anchor could be either a positive thing or a <laughs> negative thing here. So... I, I meant it in a negative <laughs> sense, but I don't want to okay. come off as like hating no, no. America. I mean, but you could see it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's been done. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could see it as we'll I got to sort out, right? <laughs> it, I mean, it, it grounds us in the sense that we're not going to go off the rails in any sort yeah. of, you know, you know, quick way that would just destroy the country within a matter of a decade. However, it does hinder progress. And I've been saying this for the last few years, but I mean, our government was designed not to work well. It was designed not to work well. It was designed that... You know, if any law was to be passed, that there would have to be overwhelming representation and approval. Oh, well, come on. Think about it. I mean, I you... think you're invoke. Well, one of the things that I'm imagining as you're saying this is the filibuster, which really only came into use like half a century ago. 
no, in the and... same way that it restricts legislation today. Well, I mean, what about the veto? How That's can you forget true. About... I can't, how you... I can't how, forget how, it. How can you deny the veto? I mean, I think there I are... I forget about it, but I'm not denying it either. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm just saying that there are so many checks and balances. <laughs> no, well, I'm just saying there's so many checks and balances to our government mm -hmm. that, I mean, I think it's fair to say that it's tough to get things through. It's tough to get no. through meaningful legislation. Yeah. To this so, extent, we've been making like I will, I've been making a physical analogy, like the the anchor. But another way to think about it is to think of it as a buffer, right? Yeah, it, sure. The Constitution buffers us from you know large swings, and this is also something that uh, you know the people of Europe and again keep the comparison straight. France didn't have because um, they had. Go ahead, Adam. I was going to say, but I it's I don't want to cut you off, but I was going to bring up a, just, I think, a wonderful example of how just the the limited scope of our government where, you know, how about under FDR where limited? You know, well, OK, but OK, you, you got to hear out the argument first, though. You're right. OK, no, well, no. Yeah. Giffen, Giffen's rhetorical question is canceled your point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, please limited. go on. <laughs> <laughs> this is just derail immediately. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean, consider the fact that you know, once FDR took office, he began passing through these, you know, all these things outside the purview of our constitution, right? The okay, alphabet so, soup. Of course, of course. So we would agree to that. However, you know, the Supreme Court, you know, a year or two later, began striking all these down one by one, yes, saying. It did. These are unconstitutional. You may not do these things. Yeah. So, so, and then of course there was the whole midnight judges controversy, but that's outside the scope of the. Yeah, no, I, I get your point. But, but my a very my, good point. My point is that whenever you know you had a U.S. president come in and say, "Oh my God, we are in the worst economic state in our country's history. Let's do something about this." The Supreme Court. You know, these men who were appointed by former conservative presidents were like, "Nope, you can't do anything. Sorry." I mean, I'm just saying that there no, are there are our government right. is designed that in so their... so does this go back to the argument that we were having before about how the the rigidity can be a strength maybe at its foundation but a weakness as progress is made outside of it. I think it, it is a strength in all. It is a it has both strength and weaknesses in both of the cases at the founding and as we have progressed as a society. And Adam's right. This, one of the things that the um, these checks and balances, like the buffer or the, you know, the 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 ankle weight, whatever we're gonna, you know, use as an analogy, um, <laughs> it does. The muzzle. It does keep. <laughs> it, it it seriously does keep us, you know, tethered to principles in a say in a way that other leaders, if without these checks and balances, could easily, you know, kind of kind of invoking, you know, some hysteria in the masses, you know, could easily have could take power. You know, mm -hmm. and do things that are that even the people who have, you know, might have supported like th this figure would not have agreed to and would have become an oppressive force. Adam, you're absolutely right. And I, I mean, it, it although I mean, times are obviously changing in the sense that, you know, the Supreme I'm Court sure. found Obamacare right. to be, uh, you know, legal, in fact, as a tax that would not have happened you know, 50, 60 years ago. I'm very confident in saying that, just given the makeup of our Supreme Court. So, I mean, I guess it depends who's in the Supreme Court. Um, and, 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 and I guess the Supreme Perhaps Court... Perhaps too much. Well, no, but here's the thing. I think the Supreme Court will reflect culture, however that problem is. The problem is that culture is already like 50 years old at that point. Okay. It reflects a culture 50 years ago. So mm -hmm. it's like, you know what I mean? So and it's... Brett Kavanaugh's culture might be different entirely from... <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah. no! <laughs> it, it, it was boofing. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sorry. We just lost half well, our subscribers. I, 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 well, I actually wanted to go like what Giffen said. Um, seemed like a perfect pivot to a, a thing that I wanted to get to, which was uh, like the sixth article, um, yeah. about the general will. Uh, so it said. Yeah, how uh, have we not gotten there yet? Yeah. Well, I think we've been just talking about other interesting things too. But this but is the a thing, huge thing. Yeah, the thing you said before, I, I thought got to it. So let me read it uh, for the audience. So the sixth uh, article is, Law is the expression of the general will. 
Every citizen has a right to participate personally or through his representative in its foundation. It must be the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. All citizens, being equal in the eyes of the law, are equally eligible to all dignities and to all public positions and occupations, according to their abilities, and without distinction except that of their virtues and talents. Jordan, we were having a conversation earlier about affirmative action. This would be the other probably main article that France would look to. Yes. Well, so... So the the, invocation of the general will. This is a... As the phrase as it was used, general will, which is, of course, English, but in, in the French, the phrase is Rousseau's, just to oh, make it clear here. Really? Okay. Yeah, Rousseau coined the term general will, mm-hmm. um, and this is what is invoked directly from Rousseau. And again, there's arguments that Rousseau, you know, it was maybe used in a way that Rousseau might not have fully agreed with, but at the very least, as it was kind of imagined in the French populace, the idea of the general will is incredibly important here. And this, yeah, I was gonna say, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who's going here? I, I wanted to make a quick remark that I just I found it interesting that almost all of the articles followed the same uh semantic or uh, maybe deeper than that formulation, which is you start with a very broad and general statement and then kind of carve away at it almost like a piece of wood to a more refined article in the end so it says laws the expression of the general will period very short statement then it you know it adds that you know citizens have the right to participate and oh but also maybe not personally but through his representative um and it must be the same for all whether it protects or punishment so that's it's defining it more and then you know all citizens are you know they're equally equal in the eyes of the law so it defines it a bit more they're equally eligible to all of these specific things like public positions and occupations, but it's according to their abilities and it's also without distinction except to their virtues and talents. So it's just like it it takes like a round cylinder and then carves it down to like a very defined shape. Round cylinder. Okay. So I, just, I, I, okay. <laughs> I think Article 6 might be the worst example of this actually because this stays pretty broad, although it does refine. A yeah. lot of the other articles refine even more, specifically by invoking law or the general will. But yeah. since Article 6 kind of defines general will, um, it's actually one of the broadest. But yeah, yeah. you're absolutely I, right. I, I just wanted to comment on the fact that, you know, just sentence one and two here, sentences one and two, I think. So you start off, law is the, is the expression of the general will. You get a sense from that first sentence that, oh, it's like, okay, they're speaking of a true democracy here where the laws do truly reflect the will of the people. And then sentence two is every citizen has the right to participate personally or through his representative and its foundation, which I thought was not a contradiction, but somewhat of an sort of undermines the first one in a sense, because I think the first one is possibly one of the truest statements and clearest statements of democracy in its most pure sense while the second one is well is it because of the clause or through his representative or through or through his representative where it's like it doesn't necessarily have to be of the general will at that point you know what i mean Mm -hmm. because you have because a representative (laughs) can very much rule against or legislate against the general will so it's maybe a small thing but i thought that was interesting no, where I was, I, I, was just taken, right. I, I was just taken aback by how clear that first sentence was. It was like, wow, this is very clear. And the second one's like, nope, just like the U.S., okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you see this a lot. So the yeah. invocation of the general will is can be viewed in a couple different um, lenses, one of which is the some sort of true ideal of a democracy, right? Um, a true representation of everyone, a collect, some sort of collective, right? Kind of goes beyond just the sum of its parts, a sure. general will. Um, but at the same time, this has been kind of criticized as kind of the um, uh, dictatorship of the proletariat, kind of like a, the worst aspects of the masses in a way. If that yes, makes sense. That was, I, I wrote that as a note. I said, how does this safeguard against mass delusion? Exactly. Yes. That's, and that's a good criticism. This is a very fair criticism. Yeah, Adam. I mean, there's, there's always just, you know, it's a, you know, a tightrope balance, honestly. I mean, it's like you look at the United States and you can – clearly point to distinct laws in our books that that just seem unjust to them to the vast majority of us it's like wait why are we throwing people in prison for decades for smoking marijuana why are we doing that and it's like 
okay, we, we seem to collectively agree this doesn't seem to be the best course of action to address marijuana in this country, right? Throwing people in prison for decades. Absolutely. But, at the end of the same, but then at the same time, the argument, like you just said, to the counter is, well, we don't legislate on behalf of what is popular, right? We, legis- we, you know, we elect representatives who legislate on what is, they think is right rather than what is popular. So, I mean, and that's... Yet, <laughs> and yet, I feel like, at least in the co- kind of general conscious of the United States, we do kind of espouse uh, democracy as one of, it, like, a true ideal. Um, sure. But again, you know, the, the clearly no one here... No one likes a true democracy, or else France and the United States would have framed it more direct. Um, sure. Well, I wonder, yeah. honestly, if that was, is that more of a, a contingency of the technology of the age? Like, how could you actually have a true democracy when you don't have the internet? Alex? For every single piece of legislation? I guess you could, yeah. Oh, for every <laughs> single piece of legislation? Yeah, but it is, so... This is actually a very good point because in the um, in the French Revolution there was a time where like d- uh, democracy was very much expanded, but within like a couple weeks you started to have turnouts for like because it was like so broad in its scope. You had turnouts that were like in um, the dozens rather than like the thousands you would expect. <laughs> this is a yeah. clear, very clear burden on the people to have to put in their sense on every single you know piece of legislation that is proposed. Yeah. I think and, it and, is. and also, I mean, there are just clear historical references, you know, made by Thomas Jefferson. You know, he's genuinely fearful of mobocracy, mm. right? Oh yeah. So I mean, so there there is that element of it too, where it's just well, the once the the masses are educated enough, then they get more of a say. But for now, it's just <laughs> it's just not conducive to a stable government to have everyone, you know, for equal equal say. Absolutely. Well, the, the, I, the, the one thing that I kind of wanted to draw like attention between was uh, six and four. Uh, it seems like these are sort of you, you can really easily imagine scenarios where six and four are put at odds. Um, and I, I was curious how is there something like I guess is more of a question for Giffen. Like how, how would these be resolved? Is there something inherent to um like the Declaration of Rights of Man in general that would resolve it. So like, for instance, um, I wrote as an example, uh, like uh, female genital mutilation in Saudi Arabia, for instance, is the general will, like the voting representative, not that Saudi Arabia votes, but in this context, the voting representative wants that to happen, but it is clearly is at odds with the first sentence of four, liberty consists in the freedom to do everything which injures no one else. So, so I don't know what Saudi Arabian law states. I no, highly I, doubt I, it draws to this I, extent from the Declaration of the that, Rights of Man. I know that, but I mean, if that scenario were to happen in a society, you know, based on the Declaration of Rights of Man. Yeah, no, okay, I get your point. Uh, it is interesting that you tied it to Saudi Arabia. Um, yeah, I guess I was just making the example so too specific. You, what you, so you're talking about, and this is a very good point, is that there's internal conflict within this document. And there is internal conflict, you could argue, within the American document as well. But it seems, because of all the exceptions in this uh, in the Declaration of the Rights of Man, it, it's very much more clear where there's conflict. Um, so, yeah, you're right. Liberty consists of doing anything which does not harm others. And then Article 6, the law is expression of the general will. So what if the general will is to allow people to do actions which harm others? It, that, that's a fundamental conflict. And the conflict is resolved either by... Uh, the bureaucracy, like the, you know, the government, the way it's been set up, you know, just the natural forces, um, you know, whether it's influenced by like corporations or if like lobbying efforts by people mm-hmm. or by, you know, mass revolt, that that's how it's resolved. But there's internal conflict here that really can't be resolved in any other way than, you know, either the legislature or the legislature or the judiciary kind of, you know, um, mm-hmm. for each individual point, explaining why one way works and the other way doesn't because there is inherent yeah. conflict here well the reason also why i asked that is because it, it is clear actually in the declaration of independence because it says you know the power is not delegated to the united states by the constitution uh or the states whatever goes to the people 
So it tells you where the default is, but I didn't see where the default was in the Declaration of Rights of Man. That's a good point, actually. Um, so the United States, are you talking about like the, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments? Uh, yeah, it's in the, the chart that you gave. It's, it's in the comparison uh, to the, the Sixth Article. So the Sixth Article... Sounds, you know, like, was... sounds, sounds like the Tenth Amendment, right? Yes. Is yeah, yeah, the yeah. Right. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, or reserved to the people respectively, or to the states respectively, or to the people. So there is kind of an invocation of the states here. Um, yes. But you but kind of says, were talking yeah. about or to the people, which is, again, this, I think I um, made a point to draw this comparison in the document. So I, I, I see what you're saying now. And you, you're right. Um, there is kind of the 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 10th Amendment kind of does give a default referral that almost seems like it's invoking the general will. Yeah. And yet, I don't think, I think the, the kind of cultural implications are different between the two. Because the I, general I will is espoused yeah. so highly that um, I think you know, in the Declaration of the uh, Rights of Man and Citizen mm -hmm. uh, is espoused so highly that it has consequences. Because you could make a solid argument that the Tenth Amendment basically is invoking the general will, um, you know, when out, you know, both as a like foundation. Well, this, the Tenth Amendment specifically invokes it as a like as, as a default. Um, but I think that you can make an argument that the document itself in espousing democracy democracy and freedom kind of invokes the general will um, inherently. It just and doesn't yet, do it in practice, though. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, because I mean, the thing is, anything not legislated by, you know, on by the states, the federal government is, you know, the, the freedom, you know, is given to the people. However, the states tend to legislate on everything. The, the federal government doesn't. Right. It's so there's never really any laws or freedom that's been left up to you. The states will legislate on it. So there's kind of the uh, idea here that the more local, um, the more direct, you know, so the state, the kind of a state's rights argument, quite frankly, you know, the, sure. the more local it is, the, the more responsive to the people it is. Um, I think that's kind of like what you're invoking. But well, you're right. Follow, follow I, Pennsylvania I, politics and you won't think that anymore. Most corrupt state in the United States. It's, it's got to be. Have you, do you follow them? Like, Not like, particularly. Dude, give me a, give me an example, Adam, and try to tie it to the Declaration of Rights of Man. Like, how about how about the fact that they wouldn't fund Pitt just like a few years ago? Oh, they, they were yeah, withholding the money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a ridiculous. Pretty much, um, they were kind of putting on a show. A hostage. Yeah, it was like it, a hostage it was, scenario. How about the fact that they continually raise taxes every single year to uh, cover increasing road costs? Like, have, have you driven through Pennsylvania on those toll roads and they continue to go They're up? like through... $30 to go to like from Pittsburgh so, to Philly. Yeah. It's no, like, the it's, toll it's roads kinda, is a big issue. It's kind of, but, but here's the thing. Like, those are just examples of Pennsylvania government. It just dive into it at some point like this what's, state what's is your larger point though with these examples? are you are you I saying the, no, the lar the, no. Of not being responsive to the people yes that was my uh, that was a okay. response to yeah. that so the idea was you know in in, pr in you know principle the constitution is saying okay if the state doesn't have anything to say about it or the federal government has anything to say about it it's up to the people but that's not true the states will just fill in the gaps where the federal government is quiet and yeah, I, I think the interpretation is basically the people are represented through the state again kind of like a state's right mentality but you, we we definitely don't well both like socially um culturally don't really invoke the general will in the same way i think in certain instances like the marijuana which we mentioned earlier um convictions we get a sense that like there's some injustice like there's something wrong with our system where a, a very solid majority of the people don't agree with this policy that is long standing in the united states and yet nothing has been done or nothing is being done. So it there's there's definitely um conflict there. You know, maybe, sure. states maybe are not yeah. good vessels of the general will and maybe that's because people don't really think of the general will in the United States in the same way that a Frenchman might be very well, you know, uh, familiarized with the idea of the general will. True. I honestly wonder if like if this is kind of meant to be like the 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 ideas at the time 
or at least like the culture at the time had a much smaller scale to it than ours does now culture um, yeah uh, are you talking about like the uh, movement <laughs> of information to you? <laughs> I, I, I i'm not sure how to quantify culture i just like we do have a much we have a much richer culture now than people in the in the 1700s. It's more just complicated, the, yeah. Just due to the fact that we just have much more leisure time, I, I think you know culture okay. will fill you know leisure time. So yeah, right? uh, that and also the sense of like, I mean, the three of us are talking and we don't have to be geographically even near each other to do that, right? Yeah, like, that's what I thought you were talking about the uh, movement of information um, and communication. Yeah. So I wonder if these ideas are like, the, like, you know, that the general will um, is, you know, you can kind of have the general will percolate up through the system that contracts, right? So you kind of have like this pocket of people go to this representative, and then he represents them in the government, right? Like it kind of it narrows it down. Uh, I wonder if that was more valid in a time that people were more geographically connected um, than ideologically connected, I guess. Because like I, I just I, so I you're saying that system breaks down now. Yeah, there's a lot of um, I I see what you're saying. So back then, the you know a group of people within like a you know living within like a certain valley or around a certain city would generally have the same kind of sense of culture, whereas now. You can not only do you get a sense of culture that expands broadly, but also it's, and I'm not sure how if we've invoked this yet, but you also can find it easy to find um, subcultures that you kind of stay sunk into, if that makes yes. sense. Yes, this, this yeah. is definitely an aspect of the culture that you didn't see as much back then, especially in the United States. Yeah. Um, so what I'm gonna, I'll tell a quick story here to kind of, I hope illustrate your point. Um, I'll allow it. <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> continue rat <laughs> <laughs> okay so um i'm gonna tie this back to the french revolution a little bit um so what had generally happened throughout history well in france like prior to the revolution you had um the government uh was kind of set up not um in paris but kind of like in a separate place right um, and what happened was the representatives, you know, it, when it came to like, you know, meeting and legislating, especially like you, if, so like a meeting of the estates general, people would come from like their geographical region, which would have a little bit of diversity within it. Right. Um, they would like go together cause that's who they knew, you know, to the, the general body. Um, and you know, they would sit with and communicate with and, you know, be with largely the people that they already knew, you know, and there's like a little bit of, again, inherent diversity there. Um, ideologically, you know, on the political spectrum. But whenever the government moved to Paris, you have something that... Wait, are changed. you forgetting a part of the story? What am I forgetting? Uh, sorry, I don't know what order you're telling it in. What, like, but, but then when the representatives would travel to the government, they would converse between each other and get a, a sense of, like, the more broad spectrum of the government. I, that's not exactly the direction I was going. Okay, I'm sorry. I was going I'm to sorry. say, so whenever... Um, the government moved to Paris and you no longer had, you could like um, kind of move there permanently instead of just kind of go there occasionally. What you had is people that were not um, organizing by kind of their origins geographically, but by their ideologies. And this is kind of like a polarizing effect. Does that make sense? People would be with their yeah. like ideological spectrum and it tended to push people to the extremes because whereas a moderate, whenever you're coming from a, the same geographical area, um, would probably be relatively moderate by any like the national scale when you have when all the people that you talk to are within like the you know ideological left or right then the the sense of moderation and like the kind of social por forces pushing you to kind of accept the general kind of consensus they, they aren't there the same way and i think we see ties to this today with the kind of um isolation you can find in subcultures on the internet mm -hmm. am i coming through yeah no i i agree with you entirely um, I was just, I, I don't know. It's just kind of, I guess, like musing about whether that degrades the idea of the general will at all. I, so yeah. So I, I guess what that leads to is a, a more, more polarized population. A, the general will gets a little bit shakier, you know, 
if you have 51% yeah. of people that, you know, are centered on over here in the political spectrum, and then the other, you know, 49% are over here, and like, there's enormous conflict in ideology, can you really say you're invoking the general will if you go with the 50, like 1%? Whereas, especially <laughs> yeah. if, again, this is what happens as a result of the polarization. If everyone is, if there's no polarizing forces as much, you kind of can get a, you know, a more reasonable sense of a general will, you know, a moderate position. But like the, the moderate position, if you have two polarized bodies, there's very few people who actually hold that value, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, the middle point. Instead of um, a bell curve. Yeah. yeah, the middle point is like an average of the two rather than a combination of the two. And yet yeah. it's, it's very lowly populated. Yes. So yeah, the exactly. idea of the general will almost seems to not be plausible. Like there's very, in addition to the conflict within the Declaration of the Rights of Man itself, you have conflict kind of ideological if you think about the general will in a very polarized population. You kind of lose that sense of the general will. And with a bell curve, you can kind of like, if you imagined a bell curve, you can kind of nod at a general, you know, kind of consensus. But two polarized bodies with very few people in the middle, general will kind of loses its, you know, force. Some sort of bimodal distribution. Exactly, <laughs> bimodal distribution. That's exactly yeah. right. Adam. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I. I just. I. I don't really know where I was going with that, but it just seemed interesting to me. It's very interesting. Well, it's kind of like U.S. politics right now. Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, Trump's impeachment. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, helpful. I'm not, I'm not, not, so, I'm not saying let's dive into it. I'm just saying, yeah. I mean, you're either for it or you're against it. You're not kind of like, well, it's kind of like I just feel like, how many people are actually going to get convinced either way at this point? Mm. Yeah. There's, I, I, mean, I definitely really? feel polarization on this issue. Now, there's probably a couple people who just aren't that involved in politics and don't really, sure. they, they could probably be swayed. But I definitely get the sense of the bimodal distribution. People who have like thought that the impeachment took too long, and people who think this is a, an absurd, you know, you know, an impeachment attempt. It's you know, like, yeah. the inquiry itself is just it's absurd. <laughs> How could we it's, impeach yeah. Jesus's representative? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like it, it, it he truly rules is, not yeah. through the people, but through God Himself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, it truly is kind of either or. I mean, because like the the situation you put forward about someone who doesn't really follow politics. They're not really in the national conversation anyway. I mean, and yet they can vote. They will vote. I'm just saying, uh, like, they might not. But when talking about, um, you know, general will here, it's like I, I mean, I think there's generally you're talking about people who are in the national conversation. And at, some, no, the, that's the thing, though. The general will kind of invokes everyone, not just like the very like almost an elitist perspective that the general will is for the people who are involved. You know. The most involved. Yeah, but I, I mean, mean I, I, but, I agree but, with you that the population should be educated. No, but it, but it, I'm just saying in practice, it's generally true. Because I mean, yeah. if you if you don't know what's going on, it's not that you can't vote; it's that you're less likely to vote. You're, you're not you're absolutely some, right. You're not someone yeah, who's you're not you know likely to be someone who's gonna, I guess, punish someone politically for ruling either way on the the impeachment process. No, if, if you don't even know what's going on, if you have no opinion on it, I mean, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, the, they're um, uh, so I don't know. It was weird. The uh, I, I don't know. Like we we've definitely mentioned these terms um, a lot on this podcast. Uh, but like so there there was um, it's a different variant of what we've been kind of saying all along. But there were a few specific examples I wanted to bring up. Um, there there's like in in terms of um how you look at the world ethically. There's um. Uh, there's a lot of like ways to look at it, but one system is called deontology, and it it places the rights of the individual above anything else. And another one is called consequentialist, and that places the consequences of an action above any other considerations. And I thought that the Declaration of Independence had specific examples of notes that were much more deontological and the Declaration of the Rights of Man had specific examples that were far more consequentialist. So that's an amazing comparison, actually. I have not heard these terms really, but that's incredible. That you yeah, so there, up. there are two. There are two like uh, there there are two uh, ideas or systems of ethics. Um, the deontology was really systematized by Immanuel Kant, who I'm assuming you've heard of. Yeah. Um, 
Kantian ethics is like a it's a specific form of it, but it basically places the right of the individual above any other considerations you may have, right? Like I said, um, and, and consequentialism places the consequences of an action above any other considerations that you may have. So if you look at, um, I, I saw these two intention between the two documents in a few specific places. So if you look at, uh, in on your comparison sheet, uh, Article 8, for instance, it says, um, the law shall provide for such punishments only as are strictly and obviously necessary, and no one shall suffer punishment except it be legally inflicted in virtue of a law passed and promulgated before the commission of the offense. But uh, to contrast that, um, in, our, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, it says excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. Sorry, that's a, a, a Bill of Rights. Um, but so do you see how it um do you see how there's like a difference between it sets up a right that cannot be superseded uh by consequences versus uh in the declaration of rights of man it provides a general framework uh however it's guided by the outcomes of that framework uh there was I can another, absolutely see that yeah yeah there was another one that in one two down from that um article 10 of the Declaration of Rights of Man says, no one shall be disquieted on account of his opinions, including his religious views, comma, provided their manifestation, their consequences, in other words, does not disturb the public law established by order. But if you look at um, Declaration of Independence, uh, sorry, Bill of Rights, uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the right exercise thereof, sorry, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And it does not provide a manifestation or a consequentialist caveat there. That is amazing, actually, that you can, you know, wrap this into the ethics, because I've, I've never seen this in this framework before, but it is almost glaringly present and yeah. yet, I'm going to bring something up here. I feel like out of a kind of a practical uh, necessity almost, the United States has adopted a little bit of the mentality um, of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Because it does say, mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of, well, you know, um, prohibiting the, uh, bridging the freedom of speech, right? Yeah. And yet we know that there are certain things that we cannot say without consequence, right? Yeah, you can't the, shout the classic, fire in a theater. Exactly. Yeah. That, is yeah, the, exactly. that is the exact thing. And that almost infuses the interpretation of, like, these founding American documents with a little bit of the, uh, the um, what, what is the uh, ethics system? The yeah. yeah, the consequ consequentialism. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> yeah, the consequentialism. Uh, I just thought it was like, it, I, I, that was, I read all of this, and then it was like, you know, two hours later or whatever, I was like, wait a minute. That's like totally the divide between deontology and consequentialism. That's amazing that you found this thread. That's amazing. Which is, it's like, it's interesting because I, I, I really don't know. And I guess I, I, I don't even know where you would look for this, but I wonder how, if that has manifested itself differently in other aspects of the the two countries or even the two cultures. I just, I don't know where you would look for that. Like, I don't even know what data would even, would even be, but I thought it was just really interesting. That is incredibly interesting. I'd be really curious to see, you know, more like on I, this. You could almost, it would almost be like a, a kind of like a social survey almost. Like, I wonder if, I, to be honest, it just seems like without empirical evidence, it seems kind of true, right? Like, if you think about the American um, mentality, it privileges the right of the individual over the consequences of of upholding that right. Like it's it's almost like um, you know, like would we'll drive the like like drive it into the ground kind of mentality. You know, like you, but you're not going to take me off the steering wheel, right? Versus the European kind of sense of pragmatic. Well, let's just do what actually gets the job done. Yeah. You're absolutely right. This is a great uh, perspective to take on this, actually. Bec and again, um, the consequences, you, you were talking about the consequences culturally. 
mm-hmm. here. I think we definitely see those. I feel like in the United States, you would have a larger proportion of the population compared to other Western nations. In fact, maybe uh, compared to any other Western nation. Mm. And, you know, if you ask people like, should um, rights like these inherent rights framed in the founding documents be infringed for the common good? I feel like you would get way more people agreeing with that kind of libertarianism in the United States than you would in any other Western country. So that's I, kind of one of the consequences, I would say. Yeah, I agree with that. And even though I feel like we have kind of infused a little bit of consequentialism into our interpretation of the founding documents, again, the fire in a theater, which is a great example, um, we still have this inherent sense in America that isn't present elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Something, something American exceptionalism. I, <laughs> I, I wonder. I, I, I sort of almost wonder if this is a um, some sort of a balancing act, maybe on the part of the American system, where you could imagine that you know most of the time this deontological way of looking at the world actually provides pretty good consequences, but. If you it but but like but say they didn't say they just immiserated everyone well then I don't think the government would hold any of those leanings right so is it I I almost wonder if it's kind of um, they are looking at it in just a weird scope almost did I, I don't do you kind of get what I'm I'm just thinking through it I see some conflict in that. Um, in the like the the practicality versus the idealism in the United yeah. States, um, and again, there's a internal conflicts within the other documents as well, like the mm-hmm. Declaration of the Rights of Man. But I I do see if that's what you're getting at, this yeah. kind of conflict between um the rights, which are you know enshrined highly, be and they're very perva- pervasive in the United States beyond other Western nations, but also this kind of this kind of like the the I most people would agree even in the United States that you gotta gotta be lenient enough you gotta gotta have mm-hmm. a loose construction of the Constitution enough to respond to a very important social you know uh, events mm-hmm. or injustices. Yeah, yeah, I, that was that was just. So one... we take in America, I would say we have um, remind me of these two uh, ethics systems. Deontology, which values rights, and consequentialism, which values consequences. Okay, so the de- it seems like the United States model is deontology with injections of consequentialism when needed. You mm-hmm. know, just little little splashes, and then, um, at least directly comparing it to France, they have a little bit more consequentialism. Yeah, just it's just I don't know. I guess it's interesting because like it seemed to me as though in the Declaration of Rights of Man. They injected, like you said, rights, but but because they would produce good consequences. Almost, it was like, always viewed within a framework. Yeah, that yeah, seemed it's limiting inherently. Yeah, but I I I almost wonder if the Declaration of Independence has that um, that injection reversed because they're injecting consequences into considerations of rights. I don't know because it's, it just seems like it's more um, it seems more contradictory in in the Declaration of Independence than in the Declaration of Rights of Man. Do you know what I mean? Like you you can it, it seems more logical or more reasonable maybe to infuse the idea of rights to produce good consequences, but it doesn't seem as intuitive or reasonable to in, inject certain consequential exceptions to rights to ensure the rights more do you, do you know what i mean i kind of get what you're going at um but just, i would have to think about it more within the framework yeah it, it i don't know it just seemed like it was more internally consistent the way that the declaration of the rights of man had it set up i would i i find myself kind of agreeing with you except i keep I, yeah. reminding myself that there are inherent conflicts within the document itself <laughs> but yeah it, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I think there is conflict, you know, with um, beyond the like in the relationship between the documents and um, like the the government or and the people. You definitely do see like logic is logically consistent from the founding document of France, 
that you would make considerations of the public, you know, one of your foundational kind of reasonings. But that is, even though we kind of do this in the United States, it is not as logically consistent. It, it doesn't logically follow from the founding document to ever impose anything that infringes on any right. Yeah. It is It is logically inconsistent. Uh, yeah. Adam, do you have I, don't, I would have to think about that more. No, I generally agree with what was said. Um, I, I think a minor distinction would be, I think... You know, in the uh, the French Declaration of, you know, the rights of man and citizen. Um, yeah, I would say that I think it's less that they're giving rights because of the consequences of giving those rights, but more so they're giving rights with the consequences of those rights in mind. So it's like, OK, we're going to give you rights, but here are some caveats to them. Right. Less so, but, you know, then. The direct, okay, we're only giving you rights because they're going to lead to good consequences. You know, I, th I think that maybe that state of mind I don't see as much in the in the document. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. Even, I, maybe that's not even falsifiable. Maybe, we, like, the answer to that is dead with the authors. I don't know. Sure, I just, that might be a too... death of the author. <laughs> I, I think that might just be too cynical a reading of history. To say I just that, don't know. To say that what? I, that, that these rights were given to them, you know, to you know, general citizens simply because of the good consequences that will lead from them, not simply because they wanted to give rights to people and add, you know, a consequentialist spin to them. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can understand. That I, 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 I think it might be too cynical, but yeah, I don't know. That's if fair. It's, I think I there were definitely idealists is, yeah. you know, in France. I mean, yeah, well. yeah. I can, I, in fact, probably, I can say for certain that like the enlightenment. So I don't know, but Otherwise, yeah, I kind of agree that, you know, even the exceptions to the limited exceptions to the Bill of Rights, they are contradictions. There is no room for, you know, exemptions to the Bill of Rights. So. Cool. I feel like we have too much uh, we, agreement here. We, well, well, I mean, first, it's just true. Where's Teddy? I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to say we've been. The the if the recording time is at an hour and forty minutes. Is there anything else we wanted to get to? I I didn't realize we've been going for so long. It was a good discussion. Uh, I wrote a couple things down. Let's see if I can uh find anything. At the at the uh, you know, I'm mindful of our listeners' attention span and of my own bladder. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I and I drank too much wine too. Like I I just <laughs> kind of so, shut down like. 90% of that conversation, I was just like, I'll let them talk because I drank too much wine. So that, <laughs> so... that, that, if anything's a sign, we should end it's that. <laughs> okay. That sounds good to me. I think we had a great discussion. Yeah. I, so, okay. what? It's like, okay, giving me the inglorious end, but okay. I came back into the conversation and you're like... <laughs> On that and day. now we're over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On Adam's stu drunken stupor, we're, we're going to end. <laughs> Even though I made a coherent point after... It was uh, coherent. I wasn't whatever. saying it wasn't. It's just I can make another observation if you'd prefer. End on a you know higher note. Yeah, so Adam's not cranky with, with me. We'll yeah, get I'll, to do that. Let, let Adam have the last word. I'll, I'll give you a, an easy one here. Oh, I... well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't be more pleased. All no, right. in, in reality, this is like the only point that I had written down that was not brought up was kind of um, one of the kind of inherent, uh, you could probably easily argue, flaws in both founding documents, both the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, as well as the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, is that if you notice even the, the phrasing of like the titles of these documents, it was just men. Yeah. Hmm. It, it was yeah. it was just men. The rights of man and citizen. And in France, I'm gonna this is this is the actual point that I'm gonna make. Um there was controversy as to what defined a citizen and what like and is citizen just everyone who lives in hmm. the you know, you know, lives in there and in the state? Or <laughs> Or is it like kind of restricted to like the um you know the well to dos you know the, the maybe it, not, maybe yes. more than the, just the nobles maybe more than just the two estates, but but the the, the urban poor mm, are they citizens? And what it was uh what it came to was a discussion on 
what is called an active citizen and versus a passive citizen. Um, and the active citizens would be able to, you know, mostly vote, participate, you know, in what was, you know, an approximation of a democracy. Passive citizens, you know, maybe they would enjoy some of the some of the protections, but they didn't have the capacity to um, have their voice be heard. Um, mm-hmm. And it kind of break. It, this is like one of the arguments that was present, you know, in the in the founding of the French uh, Republic, that easily you can argue betrays the idea of the general will. It, you know, it's the general will for me, but not for thee. Yeah, it, it, no, it's it really does. It, it almost sets up like a. Um... Uh, I kind of like the, the distinction Adam was making between like the informed electorate and the uninformed. Yeah, um, absolutely. And one of the um, so t- I'm going to tie this to American history a bit is one of the um, distinguishing factors between the um, you know active and passive citizen was whether they was property owned. And there was an argument at the foundation of the United States. And Adam, I hope you can uh, corroborate this. That like you know if you hold held property, you had a stake in the land. Um, and therefore, you would, you know, embody like the what was best for the nation. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess, well, I guess you can tell me some thoughts on, you know, the positives and negatives of a system, which kind of, not not explicitly, or maybe explicitly, you know, differentiates between different classes of people. Well, I think for the time period, I don't think it was necessarily a bad thing. Honestly, I mean. I think there's a reason most governments structured the citizenry like that. I just, I mean, you can't have 50% of the, you know, of any states voting on a subject they know nothing about. I mean, cause, e- cause even though people who are very ignorant now votes, you still have to get some sort of ed- education. And the thing is, I, you know, let, let's say you're like, you live I don't know, in the boondocks here in the United States, right? <laughs> right? Okay. You can still vote. You can still vote. But here's the thing. You will still come into contact with people that will give you, uh, you know, some semblance of the world. Unlike, you know, let's say back in the 1700s, you were laboring 12 hours a day. And everyone around you knew nothing about the world. All you knew is that you had a certain amount of bread that you were going to get at the end of the week. And you had a certain amount you had to pay to the, you know, whoever, you know, the tenant of your land. And you were always going to have less money than the tenant was asking for. <laughs> Those were the few things you knew about the world. Right. So I just, I don't know. I wonder I, how much more the boondock for, <laughs> worker knows. Though. Well, so to, to be fair though, I, you know, I, as I was saying that I was like, well, that person might know about the same yet they represent 0.000001% of the population. Now, unlike maybe, I don't know, back in the 1700s, that might have been a strong 30, 40% of the population knew nothing about the world. So. I wonder. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. And There's in a fact, lot of in America France, that doesn't. Sorry, Giffen. Well, <laughs> I, I, I would be very hard to argue that the average like American, even in like very rural and isolated areas, no like less or equal to like a, a French peasant. And you know, no, uh, I know I sure. information is here, but yeah. at the same time. So I guess what I was going to bring up was like in France, an interesting aspect of American, uh, another invocation of American exceptionalism, I guess, is that uh, the, the capital of the United States, you know, where legislation happens, is separated from, well, now there's like a, you know, large, you know, city, in Washington, D.C., but it was established originally, you know, on a swamp, right? And th- this kind of was another degree of separation between the people um, and, uh, the, you know, the government. And this is, a, you know, both positive and negative. It's a buffer in a good way because, I will invoke this, um, in Paris, the people of Paris, sometimes, you know, just like the, the angry rural or, or the angry urban poor, you know, either because they don't have enough bread, there's like bread riots, they could they could easily storm, you know, the palace. And in fact, they you know, chopped the king's head off. <laughs> yeah. like, um, it, it's very interesting, the kind of recognizing that the general will fluctuates a little bit too much to be stable. Hmm. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. I, and, I, and I would just make one more point. I mean, I think that 
I don't know. When I when I view like the average person in the United States, they might not know as much. However, I think that the average person in the United States is actually pretty well socially in, in, in tune with I don't know, I, I I would say so. I mean what with in, in tune to what? I don't know, just uh the general 20, will tw- tw- no twenty first twenty first century social culture. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not saying that you know, a, maybe a college educated person, but the average person, yeah, I think they represent someone in the 21st century, which is not a crazy statement because they live in the 21st century. But I'm just saying, like, <laughs> it's a tautology. <laughs> sure, but I think it's just a, it's the, it's the truth, though. I mean, you have access to the internet. I mean, they are probably interacting with people just maybe not around the world, but around maybe different states and stuff like that. It's it's. I don't know. It's, it's it's very different. You can't deny people, you know, the right to vote in the same way that you could in the 1700s. Yeah, absolutely. So. The rural poor in France in the 1700s could had no connectivity, whereas even someone who's the poorest place in America probably has a library they can go to and go to a chat room to talk sure. with anyone they want. Sure. Or a smartphone. Now, some people yeah. don't use it. Yeah, or a smartphone, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Mo- some people don't use those, you know... Um, privileges but they are there that is absolute they are that's a hope that's a hopeful note to end on <laughs> yep and uh thanks to all of our listeners for watching this if you uh if you got to this stage let us know uh i would be interested to hear what people think about any points uh that we are talking about in this uh discussion so comment below um but thanks for listening Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Plato's Cave. Um, I always enjoy discussing topics with uh, with these two guys. So if you want to um, support the show in any way, you can do so simply by sharing it. Uh, I'm hoping to get this show out to more people. Uh, and so if you want to share it on Twitter or social media, that would really help me. Uh, you can also rate it on Apple Podcasts. Uh, like this video if you're watching on YouTube, or subscribe uh, via Apple Podcasts or an RSS feed. Uh, you can also discuss it on your own show and link back uh, to my website, or you can connect me uh, with recommended guests or topics to cover. Uh, you can get in contact with me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com, follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers, And I now have a website for my philosophy endeavors at jordanmyers.org. If you want to know a little bit more about me and my fellow co-hosts, as I said in the introduction, I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. I did my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh, where I studied mechanical engineering and philosophy. And now that I'm back at school, I'm hoping to more closely study uh, moral responsibility, free will, ethics, epistemology, and moral psychology. Those are topics that I was uh, introduced to and got really interested in in my undergrad work. So uh, Adam and Giffen accompanied me on this show, and Adam is uh, one of my oldest friends. We actually met in kindergarten, um, and we've been interested in philosophical topics for as long as we can remember, and in a lot of ways, it's been the basis of our friendship. Uh, Adam studied chemistry and biology at Cornell, and he is currently working at a law firm, Um, and he's especially interested in moral responsibility as well, but also law, religion, and free will. Uh, Giffen is also one of my oldest friends, and Uh, We've been friends since elementary school as well. Um, Giffen studied biology and economics at RPI, and now he works in human health research. Uh, He believes that there's very interesting overlap between both of his fields of study and philosophy, and he's particularly interested in exploring political philosophy. So this series was right up his alley. Um, And with, uh, with all of that information... Again, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this episode, and I hope that you get in contact with me or or follow my work in any way that you uh, deem reasonable to do. So with that, thank you for listening.